Thank you, Father, and praise your holy and mighty name. You're so worthy, you're so glorious, you're so mighty. We come to you today in Jesus' name. Thank you for this day and many blessings. You hand upon us, your spirit leading and guidance, us, giving us this privilege and opportunity to be here today in the house of the living God as we truly are the temples of the Holy Ghost. You live and dwell inside each and every one of us. And Father, we thank you today, Father. We come before you humbly and reverently, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, as I stand here today, I know that you know every person that's under the sound of my voice. I could open my eyes and I could see them physically. May or may not know all of them, know them all, but you know the state of every heart. You know the state of every life. You know where they're at in their individual walks with you today. You know this morning the word from your word they need. You know the anointing of the Spirit of God that needs to be present to accompany the word. Now, as we step over into this service, I yield myself to be the vessel that you've called me to be a vessel meet ready prepared for the master's use conducive not only to your word but to your spirit and I thank you now the words that I speak this morning are not man's thoughts, plans or ideas but it's going to be the uncompromised infallible and corruptible word of God that's able to save their souls that's able to change and order the course of their lives now I believe as well as I have they've come this morning expecting to receive by faith all that you have in store for them and as the word of God and the spirit of God cooperating and working together this morning brings this message, Father, I believe they're going to see by faith. They're going to take it, apply it, walk it out, and it's going to change and alter the course of their lives forever. So the last amen, these lives will be changed, challenged, and altered forever. But most importantly, all that's said and done this day will give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. We thank you, Father, right now. We count these things done by faith in advance. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated in this time. <clears throat> Thank God for the Word of God. Thank God for the Spirit of God. Amen. God is with us. Matter of fact, He's always been with us. He's never left us. Don't you agree? If you agree with the Word, you know that God's never left us. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is God no matter how, what it looks like, no matter what it seems like, no matter how we feel, or really no matter how it even is. Because the things in this world are temporal. They're temporary, right? Let's, let's go to Hebrews 12 to begin with. Hebrews 12, 25. The Lord, uh, week, two weeks ago, three, I, I don't remember when. I could look it up, but it's not important for the time being. The Lord gave me this message. It started as I began last week. This will be part two. It's really a different message every week, but we're just using one title. <clears throat> the title was Unshakable. So only one word, unshakable. And we're going to see as we look at Peter here in a few minutes, Satan desires to sift every one of us as weak. Right? We have an opponent. We have an adversary. Thank God Jesus came to give life and life abundantly. Right? By our faith, trust, and dependency in Him, we can enjoy that life. But it's also a reality, as I just said, the Bible says more importantly, we have an opponent, an enemy, his name is Satan. What's his purpose? He comes to steal, kill, and destroy right? But the Lord gave me this word, unshakable, and, and, and I said it last week, it came by the Spirit of God, I don't say it to be funny, you guys know that I don't really think it's a joking matter, the Word of God and the Spirit of God, but as I kept getting this message on different fronts, different ways, you know, the Lord, and I know it goes back to the old song somebody sang, uh, song but it said uh, uh, there's a whole lot of shaking going on. So you need to be ready. Who sung, who sung that? Jerry Lee Lewis. I'm not, a, I'm not a music guru by no means, so if you want to know the latest pop song, don't ask me. If you want to know one from 1970, don't ask me. Ask somebody else. If you want some scriptures, I'll help you get it. But I'm not a music professional. Amen? <clears throat> but there's a whole lot of shaking going on, even in the body of Christ, and we need to be ready, and we need to be prepared, as I was prepared. Last week, before last week, the Holy Ghost told me. He said, there are many even now that are with you. And he said this before we ever got here. He said, there are many even now in your church that they're there because they've been shaken by me out of other places. Not by people, but they were not receiving the Word of God. They were not receiving the Spirit of God, and I've moved them on. They were shook out of there, and that's a good thing. But he said, on the negative side, there are even people with you. Because of some things that they want to hold fast to that I've told them to turn loose of, they're going to be shaken out of your company if they don't make necessary adjustments. Then there are many, even, I say many, I don't know how many. This is who the Holy Ghost told me to minister to today. There are many that in your walk with the Lord, you've already been shaken. 
So if we jump in to being unshakable, which we need that message, we might leave you off because of some things you've dealt with. But the Lord said, go back to begin with and pick them up. So even if you've been shaken, the Holy Ghost is going to pick you up this morning. The Word of God's going to pick you up. Because I'm going to be honest with you, some people will lie to you. But mostly everybody, at one time or another, has missed it. Mostly everybody. I know I have. And I don't know all of y'all. I know a few of y'all. One of the things that, that, that my dad used to say, I'm not saying he was wrong or story or wasn't true. I'll never say it. But he used to always say, I backslid, I give my heart to the Lord, and I backslid when I was 19 years old. He said it all the time. I backslid when I was 19 years old, and that was the last, I, I was miserable. That's the last time I ever backslid all the way to this day. And I mean, he was 40, 50, 40, wasn't 50 because he didn't stay here that long, but he was in his early 40s, I would say at that time. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, my Lord. He's back to the 19, never missed it again. I'm only 20-something, and I probably missed it 1.5 million times. I'm back, you know, since I was 19, I can't keep up with him. Now, I'm not blowing, you know, the devil up. By no means, it was all my ignorance. God said his people was destroyed by what? Lack of knowledge. Yeah, ignorance. Lack of knowledge. So we need to be knowledgeable of the Word of, of God, rightly divide the Word. But that's what we're going to do is go back this morning. Let's, let's, let's read this first. <clears throat> this will be part two of, of the message, Unshakable. There's going to be a theme Sunday mornings this whole month at least. And then you'll see it's going to start as well differently, but a similar flow on Wednesday night this coming week. It would pay great dividends, not only for you as part of the church, but for you and your own personal walk with God to be here on these Wednesday nights because we're not just going to teach you by precept, but also by example. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I learned how to pray by listening to other people pray. And then, of course, in line with the Word, it gives you direction. But you can listen to people pray that know how to pray to help you. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, verse 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not, who refused him that speaketh on earth, much more shall not we escape. If we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet, what, yet once more, I shake not earth, the earth only, but also heaven. And all of these go back to the, the, the Ten Commandments. It goes back to several different things and what's to come. If you want to know a little bit more detail, go back and get last week's message, because I, I don't have time to cover that part this morning. But verse 27, and this word yet once more signify the removing of those things that are shaken. In the shaken or shaking, there are things that need to be removed in order for you and me to go on with God. It's a fact. Amen? <clears throat> As of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. You know, as a child of God, you might be shaken, but if you got your focus and faith in the right one, you don't have to be moved. Not a hair. Zero. None. No matter the storm, no matter the wind, no matter the waves, no matter the opposition, you do not have to be moved. <clears throat> 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. What, what's the kingdom that we have now? Obviously, we make up part of the kingdom of God. This kingdom is built on a sure foundation. This sure foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the rock, the word of God. Amen? It's built upon Him. And it shall not be moved. I wonder what it would have to do with us being moved or not. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace. We thank God we're empowered by grace where we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. Now we're going to see an experience. God's already a consuming fire. We're going to see an experience that outpouring and the fire of the Holy Ghost in a measure like never before, but the shaking must come first. And it's already taken place. It's been taking place. This is not a new message about the Spirit of God, but it is part of what's going on. We need to have our focus on spiritual, godly things primarily. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, not on earthly things. You say, well, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is what is really real? Spiritual things that you can't see with your natural eyes is really what's real. What's temporary? Everything you see. Right? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 real quick. Well, along these lines. <clears throat> verse 16. <coughs> 2 
2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, says, For this, for which cause we faint not. Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. A lot of people get caught up in aging. I always make this statement, which is biblically true. I'm going to live forever. I'm getting better every day. Amen? He said, well, well how, how can you say that? Well, it's according to what you focused on. And it's according to where your faith is at. Right? The inward man is renewed day by day. This body will age to a certain degree. But the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are what? Our focus must not be on a kingdom that can be moved. It must be on what? But the things which are not seen are eternal. That's an eternal focus. If we look, I can't, oh Lord, there's so many of these. Look at Colossians 3. We'll stop at this one and go to the what I got in my notes here. It's necessary. Colossians 3 verse 1 tells us, if you, if you then be risen with Christ, if you look those definitions up, instead of saying if, it would be better said to say, since you are risen with Christ. Because he's talking to the church. You are risen with Christ. You are children of God. Right? You are identified as death, burial, and resurrection. You are an heir and a joint heir with Christ Jesus. Since you are in Christ, since you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection your affection is what? It's your mind, your thoughts, your attention on. That's why many people miss out. They don't realize it because that's what most of the church is doing. All of their affection and attention and focus and effort and work is on everything that's temporary here on the earth. You're wasting valuable time. What matters above all else is God and the will of God in our lives on this earth. We're here to build His kingdom. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Right? So our focus needs to be on temporary or eternal things. On eternal things. Our God is eternal. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We must change our focus. And if we already headed that way in a greater measure, we must mind spiritual eternal things. If we as, individual, as individuals in the church, or the church corporately, is going to be spiritual and accomplish the will of God, we've got to fit the flow of the word and the spirit and not the world. Right? Much flesh is in the church, and I don't mean your body. I mean yielding to the flesh as opposed to being led by the Spirit, and we're going to have to follow God's master plan, which is laid out in His Word. Right? Now, today, at the instruction of the Holy Spirit, I, I said this, I'm going to say it again in a measure, we will minister to the shaken, some that have been through some things lately, whether by your own doings or maybe attacks from the enemy, and you have been shaken. Even today, you may feel damaged, bruised, and shell-shocked, so to speak, from what you have been through. But God has told me today to give you the word and then to minister to you. Psalms 107, 17 through 20. Don't, you don't have to go there, but verse 20 says, He sent His word and did what? <clears throat> and healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. Jesus Christ is our healer. He is our deliverer. Right? John 8, 36, we know in 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. John 8, 36, who the Son has set free, if therefore, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. God has sent His Word, He sent Jesus, so that we could be free from everything the enemy has to offer. If we'll only believe, we will receive the freedom, this freedom is a reality in our lives. Now in, in this, this scripture in Hebrews 12, it's, it comes together, but it's 4531 in the Greek. It says, those things which cannot be shaken. And that word shaken, it means to waver. God doesn't want us to waver. It means to agitate. It means to topple. It means to destroy. Who comes to destroy? Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. To move, to disturb one. That's not the will of God for your life. In my life, and I looked up the word unshakable in the Webster's Dictionary, it says not possible to weaken. When your faith is in God, no matter what you face or no matter what comes, you'll not only just make it, you'll not even be weakened. Amen. Because you're strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Not in yourself, right? 
not able to be shaken. It means not able to get rid of. The devil might have wanted to get rid of you, but you're still here. Right? Yes. Now, this is God's will for our lives, is to not be shaken. But I want you to go back to Luke 22, starting in verse 31. <clears throat> I told you a while ago, he's going to look at Peter. No matter the state or the place that you are in your life today, there's several truths that we can state, but one of them is no matter where you are, if you will call upon the Lord, He'll answer you. He'll meet you where you're at. Now, a lot of people take that as He'll come and stay with you where you're at if you've been in sin or going a different direction, and that's incorrect. There's a Godward side and a manward side to everything. God will meet you right where you're at. I heard a minister say one time, it doesn't matter how you got in the pit, whether you got pushed in, whether you messed around and slipped in, or like a lot of people, whether you jumped in, if you call out to God, He'll reach out. Yes. He'll meet you there. That's always true. I know it's true from the Word, but even from my own personal life, as I said earlier, we've all missed it at different times, and once we come to the realization of it, you repent, there's time to refresh it, and we just enter right back into God's presence and fellowship. Amen? Amen. And we want to see that today, but a reality is, is... God wants better for you and me than we've ever walked in, but do you and I have a part to play? Yes. We get caught up in, in years as you go from 2019 to, mm -hmm. to 2020, and many people say, well, 2020 is a fresh start. Well, let's be honest with you. If we do the same things that we did in 2019, 2020 is going to be no different. That's not correct. That's not biblically correct, because you only reap based upon what you sow. If you sow the same things, make the same decisions that were made in 2019, we're going to make the, we're going to reap the same thing in 2020. If we do it exactly the same, it'll be no different. You get all these prophetic words. I'm not against them. The Lord give me a few words for this year. But the reality is, even what the Lord has said here, we could decide to do our own thing or go a different way, and it'd be the worst year we ever had. Yeah. Right. So you got God's will, but does your will have anything to do with it? Yeah. Yes. Let's look at Luke 22. We'll look at Peter. Everybody likes to read about Peter. <clears throat> verse 31. Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. What is this? Verse 31. Satan has desired to sift you. And that's the opposite of shake. I mean, unshakable. Because part of the definition of shift, of sift, is to shake, to riddle. It means by inward agitation to try one's faith, this is the purpose, to the verge of overthrow. The enemy wants to overthrow your faith. He doesn't want you walking out the plan of God for, for your life, right? And he, he used any tactic available to get you to be moved and doubt God. But are we going to do that? No. 32, but Jesus said this, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. The Amplified of verse 32. I want to put this up here if we've got it. Verse 32 says this. Because we don't just see what Jesus is saying here. We see what he's telling Peter. He's prophesying, so to speak. He's saying, Satan desires to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed that your faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So he said here in verse 32 in the Amplified, he said, I have prayed especially for you, Peter. That your own faith may not fail. And when you yourself have turned again. That's key words. When you yourself have turned again. Strengthen and establish thy brother. The New Living Translation of verse 32 says this. I have pleaded in prayer for you Simon. That your faith should not fail. <coughs> so when you have repented and turned to me again. Strengthen your brothers. When you have repented and turned to me again. King James says, when thou art converted, how are you going to be converted? How do we turn back to God? Is that a decision we make? Yeah. He said, so when you have repented and turned, repentance always means turning. Right? Repentance, by definition, it includes heart, it includes mouth, it includes thoughts, but repentance is always reversal. Yeah. Somebody says, I repent, and keeps doing the same things. That's not biblical repentance. It's not accurate. It's false repentance. Right? If you have turned away this morning, what do you need to do just based on the scripture? Well, can you turn away and then turn back? Isn't God merciful? Isn't he forgiven? Doesn't he love you? Right? How do you know he loves you? 
Well, they said so, but then the greatest act that's ever been, the greatest act of love ever was for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? The Lord Jesus Christ, who they believe in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. But he's told him this, let's read a little further, 33, and he said unto him, Lord, he said unto him, Lord, 33, he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Now, a lot of people want a word from the Lord, but not, not one like that. Right? But thank God, the love of God, and God never changes, and He never fails. We go on down, and, and He's telling them to pray in the garden, and I don't know how on your pages in your Bible, but if you, you go on down, and in, in verse 46, He said, Why well, sleep? You're talking to the disciples. Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Then if we looked at 47 through 53 there, one of the things that we would see is that uh, when, when they realized what was about to take place, when they were about to take Jesus, and, and, and I will say capture him, but he surrendered himself, and, and <clears throat> had him be crucified, what did Peter do with one of the soldiers? It said in one of those books, his name was Malchus, or Malchus, how do you say his name? But he, he drew his sword and, and cut his ear off. In defense of Jesus, and of course Jesus stopped him and, and took and healed the guys here immediately. But if you think about it, at this time Peter was 100% for the Lord Jesus Christ. So then let's go down to verse 54. Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest house. And where was Peter? You can picture this in your head. Peter followed afar off. So he's there. They've got Jesus. <laughs> They're taking Jesus up to the high priest house and, and Peter's falling just like a little bit, but he's watching, right? 55, and when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall, were set down together. Where was Peter? He's there with them. Peter sat down among, among them. Verse 56, a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire, earnestly looked upon him. He's sitting there all innocent, right? Probably not saying much of nothing. And she said, this man was also with him. Remember what Jesus said. Before the cock crows three times, Peter, you'll deny me. Before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. And he denied him. Right? Saying, woman, I know him not. 58. After a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another, confidently affirmed, saying of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, man, you know, if you looked up some of the other, in, in some of the other books here, you would see that he even went to cursing and, and was absolutely emphatic. He said, I know not what thou sayest, and immediately while he had spake, the cock crew. <clears throat> so Peter one of Jesus' closest followers, Peter, James, and John, spent time with him, walked and talked with him, heard these things about Jesus being crucified. Now sees Jesus, he's headed to give his life for all of mankind. He's going to stick with him to the end. And Peter was the one over in John chapter 6 that said, it doesn't matter what everybody does, anybody does, nobody has eternal life but you. We're willing to die with you. doesn't matter. Right? They even said that at different times. Remember they went to Lazarus in John 11. Jesus wanted to raise Lazarus from the dead, and they thought naturally that he was crazy. He's already dead to begin with, but then they're going back through when they come, and it's a very volatile situation, and they, and they said, let us all go down together. So Peter, in a great measure, has been loyal, right? Missed it along the way in, in some areas, but he's been loyal, and now, just as Jesus has said, now Jesus is separated from them. Jesus is in captivity, if you want to call it that. He surrendered himself. They didn't take him in that sense. He said, no man takes my life, but I lay it down, right? But, but now they have Jesus. Peter has followed Jesus. He loves Jesus. But has Peter betrayed Jesus? He has betrayed the one that loved him like nobody did. And you can think of all the memories that Peter had all the way back when he was recruited by Jesus when they were fishing on that particular day in Luke chapter 5. And, and you see where he said, you know, they fought to follow me and forsake all. And, and they intended to do that and did that and left their work, left what they knew. Of course, took their families with them and they had followed Jesus. And I've come all the way down to this, this time in this place 
in his life. And he said, Jesus said, Satan has desired to sift you. And as I said earlier, it doesn't matter if we don't want to talk about it in church. Satan desires to sift you. Yes. It is, it's not popular, but it's true. He wants to destroy your family. Yes. He wants to destroy your children. He wants to destroy your individual life. He wants you to go bankrupt. He wants you to die early. All of those things. Now, I don't say that to give you a spirit of fear because we shouldn't have one. He's not giving us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Yes. Right? But the reality is, is that Satan is our adversary, our enemy, our opponent, and we, are, we have no reason to fear. But if the Bible is true, we do need to be sober and be vigilant. We do need to be on guard. We do need to be paying attention. Right? And the, the Bible says, yes, be sober, be vigilant, because you have to sure adversary the devil as a roar not seeketh who he may devour. He can't just devour who he wants to. He can't take you at will, but he does oppose you, and he's looking for an open door, right? So Jesus has told Peter that Satan desires to sift you as wheat, and now we've got Peter, and, and Jesus has said, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. Did that happen? Yeah, verse 60 says, Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest, and immediately, while he yet spake, what happened? <coughs> The cock crew, right? Can you imagine when he heard that? 61 would be harder than what he heard. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Can you imagine when the cock crew and Jesus turned and looked and his eyes lined up with Peter's? The Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And what, what did Peter do? He remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Now, as the Lord has impressed upon my spirit today, many reasons, many things could have happened in your life. But there are people here that you have tried and tried and tried. You've got up and got up and got up. Different things that may be some sort of sin that the enemy's endeavored to, you know, attach to your life. Different things may have come through different people. Uh, I, don't, I don't have any idea of the cause or the reason behind those things other than all opposition eventually goes back to its father, Satan, right? He's the only one that opposes us in our walk with God. But no matter how many times you've endeavored to get back up, the enemy has endeavored to convince you that there's no purpose in getting up anymore. There's no purpose in trying anymore. You'll come to church. I know because I preach to you today, but I've been there. You'll come to church and you'll hear even faith build message, messages. God loves me. God's for me and all of these sorts of things. But you allow what you've been through to determine and dictate who you are. And you'll say, I hear that. I know it's true, but I've missed it so much. It's good for those other people, but it's not for me. The Holy Ghost sent me here today to tell you it is for you. It is for you. Amen. It's not God's will that we sin and miss it. I'm not preaching and teaching that, but if you missed it last night or this morning, it's time to turn back to God. We are in the year 2020, and it does mark one thing. This marks one thing today even greater than yesterday. Every minute we're closer to the end of time. Every minute we're closer to leaving this earth and going to heaven, whether you and I leave by rapture or we leave by taking our last breath here on the earth. You've got some things to accomplish. Amen? And the devil's endeavored to convince many well, it's just little old me, and it's little old us. Or look, no, if he can convince enough people that what they have, their supply, is not important, they don't matter, you know, just sit down, be quiet, don't do a thing. He can convince enough people that you can't make a difference. Just think, if he convinces just about everybody of that, you get enough people thinking that, then nobody move forward doing anything, right? We put our trust and faith in God. You matter, I matter, we all matter, we all have a part to play, we all have a supply to bring. It's our decision if we do so, but don't allow the devil to disqualify you when God in Jesus Christ and the precious blood has already qualified you. Yes. Amen? Yes. People think they're not good enough, they're not worthy enough, they can never be anything because of what they've done, maybe even who they are right now, but our identity must be in Christ Jesus. Yes. Amen? Thank God when, I, when he died, I was crucified with him. Positionally, The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Yes. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Yes. Right? If we'll get our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, the work he's begun inside of us, he's well able to bring to fruition and completion, but he needs our cooperation by faith. We must trust him to do so. 
You must believe that God is real and true. You must believe the Lord Jesus Christ died for you, rose again on the third day. You must believe that every word of this scripture is true. I thank God today. I thank God. Thanks be unto God who gives me the victory. Yeah. Through my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You say, I feel broken. I feel shattered. Colossians 2 10, 2 10 says, We are complete in Him. Yeah. Yes, in and of myself. Maybe what I've been through, we can't focus on those things. Right? Many think we need more of an awareness of everything, everybody, everybody's feelings. We need more of an awareness and a knowledge of God's Word. Yeah. That's what sets us free. Yeah. Our feelings will keep us in bondage. Yeah. We need to know the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Yeah. You're going to have feelings of bondage, feelings that are temptation, feelings of all sorts of things. You don't go by them. You go by the Word. Yeah. When you feel more bound than any time in your life, you can take Romans chapter 6. This is one of my favorite chapters, but passages. Romans chapter 6. Hold your place and look at it. Because I'm going to come right back to that. Romans chapter 6 is talking about the whole chapter. Walk in newness of life. Is what my heading says. But I'm not starting in verse 1. Go to 22. Romans chapter 6, verse 22. <clears throat> says, but now being made free from sin. This is the Christian. This is by Christ Jesus. Being made free from <coughs> sin. And become servants to God. You have fruit unto holiness. And the end everlasting life. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God. Is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now wages you earn. But the gifts you receive. Right? The gift of God. Is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You're not ever going to do anything. Good enough by your own actions. To earn salvation anyways. To earn standing with God anyways. Your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is what provides you with that standing before God. Yeah. I could go boldly to the throne of grace today because of what Jesus has done, what he has accomplished, and where he sits today. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. When I go to him, I tell my children, and I tell you the same thing. A lot of people think it's real cute and sweet. We go to different events and stuff, and people, even Christians, pay no attention, and they say, oh, that's so awesome. They praise. <laughs> they might as well eat dirt because they did nothing. They didn't go to the Father in Jesus' name. And when they got done, they didn't thank the Father in Jesus' name. When you leave God the Father out and leave Jesus the Son out, you haven't prayed anything. Amen. That's nothing. We teach our children your access to the Father. Biblically speaking, people say that don't matter. That's one of those things that matter above all else. We teach our children, no matter how you pray, whether you say God, Heavenly Father, however you pray, going into prayer, we say, Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you this food is blessed. We thank you we are healed. We thank you we are saved. We thank you we are free. We thank you we are delivered in Jesus' name. Amen. He's our access. He's our everything. You remove Jesus, you have nothing but death out on the grave. Amen. We need him. But my position is this, being now made free from sin. So I'm not going to go around talking about, oh, I failed so many times. I've missed it so many times. This is just my vice. This runs all the way through my family. It may, but you got a new family. you got a new bloodline. Amen. Now your focus is not on my last name's Wallace. My focus isn't on being a Wallace. Your focus isn't on your last name. There's a lot of people that's endeavoring today through all these different things. And, and, and I guess it's your business. That's fine. But they're trying to find all of their family. My God, find out who your family is in the body of Christ. Yeah. I've, I've seen a lot of people trying to find out who the family was. And they got to search and find out some things. wish I could find out. Then you find out you got murderers in your family. You got all sorts of things in your family. I remember Brother Randy said he looked this up. He said, We got robbers, we got thieves, we got murderers, we got preachers, we got prophets, we got he said, We got so much in our family, we just don't want to look at it no more. You get confused at what you really are. But you get your eyes on the word of God, right? If any man's in Christ, you're a Christian, he's a new creature. You got a new nature. So what am I going to say? That's just what I've always been. That's the way it's always been. I'm not born this way and I'll die this way. Well, if you're a Christian, you was you might have been born that way, but you've been born again. Yes. Right? Yes. You've been born again. Yes. On the day I made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior in my life, he said, I don't believe that. Well, be real careful because if you don't, you're going to hell. Yes. And I know that's unpopular in church today. You're not supposed to say those things. But it's true. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And whether I go to heaven or hell and spend eternity there, it's based upon whether I put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ or not. Amen. It's not in if I feel good on Sunday morning. It's not if the preacher can preach something that I just like. No, it's based on my decision and what I do with Jesus. Amen. I'm going to get my eyes fixed on him. Your identity is not that you're a failure. 
Many people say, I'm just an old sinner. No, you were. That's a religious statement that's ignorant. You were an old sinner. Now you've been saved by grace. You're not both of them. Right? <clears throat> Many say, I'm just an old sinner. I was a sinner. Now the Bible says I'm called to be a saint. You say, you shouldn't say you're a saint. That's what the Bible calls me and you. We're saints. Right? The Bible says so. We're Christians. We're children of God. This morning we're in his family if we've made Jesus Lord of our life. Amen. Amen. He said, I'm not sure if God loves me anymore. Well, if you're a good parent, then we know God's even higher. And the Bible says so. But if you're a good parent, even if your children make you want to wring the neck. Sometimes. You don't agree with nothing that they're doing. They act in the fool or whatever. I've seen numerous godly Christian parents say that they'd love to wring their neck and all sorts of things. If they was just a little bit younger, what they do to them, they'd get a tail cutting. If they was younger than they are, sometimes they get grown. They all get grown. But they'll always say the same thing. They still love them. The love never changes. And they, they love them. They love them when they act acting right. They love them when they don't. Now you father, you feel that you're father along than God. You feel like you have the capacity to love greater than God. I know we can walk in the love of God, but that you can love greater than God. Well, even when you go the wrong way, even though it's not God's will, do you believe God's still for you? Go to First John chapter two. We'll just read the Bible. You don't have to take my word for it. First John chapter 2. <clears throat> we know what he said in 1 John 1 9. Most all of us know that. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why couldn't today be the first day for the rest of your life? A fresh start. 1 John 2 verse 1 says this. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. To make sure this message is balanced. We're not a church or a people that's condoning sin and saying things are all right. What did Jesus say? What did the Father say here? I write unto you that you sin not. We're not saying that it's okay to sin. That's not what God said. He said, I write unto you that you sin not. But then he said this, if any man sin, if any man sin, what do we got? Now we talked about an adversary earlier who's an opponent. Right? One of Satan's greatest tricks you got to remember how he operates. Most of the church is looking for the devil to show up with a long red tail and horns out of his head. And he shows up looking better than most Christians you know. He's slick. He's deceptive. One of the greatest things that he does is really make people that believe that he don't even exist. You'll hear Christians in the church so like, if you start talking about spiritual things, all that, that, that's not spiritual. That's what the devil wants you to believe. It is spiritual. It's Satan. Very often. And it needs to be dealt with. Right? But they're looking for the devil to show up with horns. <clears throat> the devil's greatest tool would be, or, or tactic, or, or his, his greatest goal would be to get you to believe that he's not even real. But another thing he wants to get you to believe is there's no hope for you, right? That God is upset with you. That God is against you. Just like a good earthly father or mother. God can disagree with decisions you're making in your life because they contradict your word, his word, excuse me, but he still loves you just the same. He still loves you. And he wants nothing more than for you to get right back on the right track. And aren't, aren't you that way with your children? You want nothing more for them to get. You want to do everything you can. Even when they do things that cause themselves problems, you want to get them back on the right track. Now, do you believe your father wrong than God? I don't think none of us would say that. So do you believe that God loves you that much? If you have messed up, if you have slipped up, if you have sinned, is God against you? See, the devil will get people steady going in the wrong way because they say, there's no hope. God's mad at me. He's upset with me. He's give up on me. That's not the Bible. It's not. I tell people all the time to balance things out. There are many Christians that are on the spiritual junkie and they're not profitable for the body of Christ at this moment in time. The Bible talks about the profitable and the unprofitable servant. But God doesn't put people on the trash heap. The devil talks Christians into getting on the trash heap. That's the only way you end up there. To be unprofitable is by the decisions that you and I make. What did God say? If any man sin, we've got an advocate with the Father. What does that mean? Even if I sin, even though it's not God's will, I've got an advocate with the Father's name, Jesus Christ. Yeah. This morning, in this church, in your life, you've got an advocate. The devil tried to convince you otherwise, maybe. We've got an advocate. His name is Jesus Christ. He's for us. Advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Is God for us this morning? Yes. And if God be for us, who can be against us? 
Go to Mark 16. Mark 16. If God be for me, who can be against me? Right? My best days. Your best days are yet ahead of you. Amen? See, there's a stirring that started, but it's going to grow in intensity. You've got to believe this is true or it won't work. It's still real. It's not real. It's not true or false based on my belief. But it only becomes a reality in my life as I have faith in God's Word. Amen? Yeah. God. He said, hold your place for that. He said in Romans 6, we read 22, but he said this in verse 18. He said, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Being then, being then when? But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. As you receive the word, you go out and do the word, you know the truth, you walk in that, you know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You'll face that temptation, that test, that trial. The devil will come and say, you're a failure, you're going under and not over, and you say what? You're a liar in Jesus' name. And that's why we're looking at the Word, because you're not going to tell him that's what Pastor Jason said. You're going to say that's what the Bible says. Right. God said in His Word, you can't convince me I'm going under because I'm going over because my faith is in Jesus. And you tried to kill Him, and on the third day He rose from the dead. Yes. And the same Spirit that raised Him from the dead, right, yes. has quickened and made alive more my mortal body. Now we're going to look at this last little part here. Peter betrayed Jesus. Really and truthfully, it wasn't a betrayal of Judas, but this was a, a, an ultimate betrayal by all means. But was Peter repentant? Yes. And Jesus had said ahead of time, even though Satan desires to sift you as wheat, what did Jesus tell him? When you're, I pray that your faith fail you not, and when you converted, strengthen thy brother. And he's talking about what's to come. Mark 16, verse 1. When the <laughs> Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, come to Jesus' grave. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Remember what he prophesied? Yeah, yeah he's not there. But go your way. To, and we, we still got Peter in mind, right? This butts together. We got Peter in mind. Yeah. Peter said, I'll follow you to death. If it takes my death, I don't care. And we know ultimately he did die upside down on the cross. But he said, I'll follow you to death. But then what happened in the process of time? He denied him three times. His Jesus, His Lord, His Savior, He did the last, you, you, you can remember that gaze when they locked eyes in 60 or 61 there, they locked eyes, Peter remembered what Jesus said. Oh, I can only imagine. Now Jesus has risen from the dead. Now you know that Peter has heard this repeatedly, that this was coming, it's becoming a realization, it is real, it has took place. You can imagine the feelings Peter felt inside. Now, my Jesus has risen from the dead. And the last correspondence we had was when I betrayed him and we locked eyes. That's the last thing you remember, but you remember what Jesus said. Oh, Satan desired to sift you as weak. And I pray that your faith fail you not. Isn't it, God? Isn't it good to have God for us? Good to have the Lord Jesus Christ. How don't you look at this? Because see, this morning, you can put your name here. This is one of my favorite passages. He said in verse 7, Jesus said, <clears throat> well, well, the, the one that was speaking said, but he said, go your way, tell his disciples. Wasn't, wasn't Peter a disciple? Yes. You notice how this is written here? Mm -hmm. Tell his disciples and Peter. Tell his disciples, and you, you know that Peter was dealing with some self-doubt about what was to come. I'm sure he was excited. Obviously, that Jesus is no longer in the grave. But the reality is, last thing that took place was he failed Jesus. Go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher. For they trembled and were amazed, neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now, I'm going to make a couple comments here before we close this service. But I also want you to look at verse 9. 
Because there's many people that have disqualified themselves because of their life, past life, what they've done, who they've been, maybe far off, maybe even recently. But this has always stuck out with me too. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to who? First person Jesus appeared to was Mary Magdalene. She'd be one of most of the rest of them, even part of the religion. All of the religious church would have thrown her away. She's one of the first people that Jesus, oh, I, I could go all day on this, I'm not going to. But people disqualify themselves from serving God and being received by God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ for the very reason that you're actually qualified. If you could save your own self, you wouldn't need Jesus. Deliver your own self, you wouldn't need him. Right? The very first person he showed himself to was Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven devils. She was more than full of the devil. The very first person, she wasn't dead, he set her free. But the very first person he showed himself to was Mary Magdalene. And you thought she wasn't good enough. He said, go your way, tell the disciples and Peter. If you don't have a mark, you should have a mark in your Bible. Because there's going to be times the devil tries to get you convinced. Not you. You're worthless. There's no hope. You've messed up. You've sinned. You've come short of the glory. The Bible says even when you sin, you've got to have to do with the Father. See, what we have a hard time understanding is even when we miss it and change, God does not. He never changes. Amen? Many people question, where is God? He's the same place he's always been. God has never run off and left you and me. Amen? It's not how it operates. Thank God for his word. Thank God for his spirit. We say today, no matter how bad you've missed it, drifted away, or sinned, it's time to come back home. You remember the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15. We're not going Luke chapter 15, starting at 11 or so. He had everything. <coughs> we had everything in Christ Jesus. We had everything that he needed right there at home. He wanted his inheritance. I'm going to go out here and live my life. And did he do it? Yeah, what happened? What the devil always does. I have people about church. I have people about church sometimes. They say, you know, so and so is trying to get me to do this, that, or the other, and I'll ask them. Now, if I say this, people get smarter. People try to pick people out of the church, and I always ask them this. Where are they trying to get you to go? Where are they trying to get you to go? A lot of times I'll tell them what they're endeavoring to do is they just really want to get you out of church. Cause issues. They don't look out for you, benefit you good. You need to obey the voice of the Holy Spirit and do what he's saying. Stand to your feet. Amen? The devil wants to convince us, wants to convince you, wants to convince me, really to convince everybody that you don't matter and you've been invested to such a degree there's no hope.